All right, so as a review, right, we were, we were learning about demand. And what is this concept of demand, right? What is this representing? The consumer, exactly, very good. So it's the consumer and specifically the consumer's willingness to pay, right? And you'll see that abbreviated as WTP in all caps, right? So this is willingness to pay. Right, so the consumer's willingness to pay, right? That's what's, that's what's kind of dictating what's going on here, right? And we know that if we were to, you know, draw a graph of this, it's going to be this L-shaped graph. And really, I mean, let's think about what is this L-shaped graph at the end of the day, yeah. Boom. Good job, absolutely, yes. <laughs> you email me after class, you get extra points for that. Oh, perfect, yeah, <laughs> nice. I played, I played D&D &D with it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so this is the first quadrant, absolutely, of the Cartesian coordinate plane, right? This is the, the positive, positive section, right? Where we're talking about positive bits of Y, right? And we're talking about positive bits of X. Okay, and so we're just, we don't deal with any of the negative stuff in economics, right? We don't, you know, it doesn't kind of, it doesn't make any sense to deal with negative goods, right? I mean, we do have debt, but it's, you know, that's another kind of layer of complication, right? So for right now, we're just dealing with this first quadrant of the uh, Cartesian coordinate plane, very good. And so we know that when we're drawing these graphs, right, we're gonna have the same axes, and we have a little mnemonic, right? We can just go according to the alphabet, L, M, N, O, price goes over here, and then quantity goes on my x-axis, right? And then we know that our demand curve is what? It's downward sloping. Our demand curve is downward sloping, right? Reflecting the fact that if we have any sort of change in the price, right? If we have a, a sale, why do companies run sale? Because they want to get rid of stuff, right? They're able to sell this amount. So the kind of, when we talk about generic stuff here, right? We would say that this is P zero. This is Q zero, right? So this is my starting point. And then when they go ahead and they, they, they go on sale, then that's going to P1, which when we reflect that off of the demand curve, gives us Q1. Okay. Questions on demand curve, axes, labeling, everything's good. All right, cool. So then we talked about the supply curve, right? And we said there's also using that same axes of price on the y axis and quantity on the x axis, we also have a curve that is upward sloping, that is telling us the producer's and then instead of willingness to pay, we've got a willingness to accept. So the willingness to accept, right? The lowest price that they're willing to accept. And so for various reasons, as the price goes up, more people are going to be, you know, jumping into the market, any given market, right? And they're going to be, or they're going to be willing to scale production up more. So if all of a sudden, you know, uh, the price of coffee or something like that goes up a lot and the demand goes up a lot, then, you know, Bean Broker is going to have more hours open or something, right? 
before another coffee shop's gonna open, even though we just had Just Love open last year, right? Just because, but that would be not really a change along it. So change along it is really just one company kind of expanding because of the, because of the increase in the price. So we've got to put these two together. Put these two together in order to get to the crux of economics, right? Which is this notion of equilibrium. So go ahead and we'll put the supply curve like that. We'll draw the demand curve like that. And then X marks the spot where these two meet. That is going to be my P star and my Q star. To denote that that's the equilibrium. So what do I mean by equilibrium, right? Equilibrium is this term. So it's essentially everything that's demanded is sold. So everything, everything produced is sold. And then everything demanded Everything wanted or needed, right, is consumed, is purchased, is bought. Bought, sorry, running out of room. Let's say bought. That's what this equilibrium point is. And to really prove this to ourselves, right, we can say, well, what if the equilibrium price was a little bit higher? So let's go ahead and as a thought experiment, say, what if we have P H? price that's higher, right? Well, at pH, when we reflect that price off of the demand curve, right, at that particular price, there's only Q H demanded. And at that particular price, that's incentivized a lot of sellers to produce more and so there's a whole bunch. So we should actually be labeling these, the supply, this is supplied, and this is the demand. And so this, when supply is greater than demand, is what we call a surplus. So if there's a surplus, what ends up happening? Great question. Well, if there's a surplus, if they're smart, producers and other people that are in charge, right? If they're smart, then they're gonna go ahead and they're going to lower the price, right? So they can get some movement along the supply and demand curve. So they might lower it and have it on sale somewhere right here, right? Sale. But then they'll still see that, okay, you know, we're getting more sold, right? The, the quantity that we're selling, because really the demand is telling us the actual amount that we're selling, right? This is, this is what's telling us the total revenue, right? Total revenue is equal to the price times the quantity demanded, right? It doesn't matter how many you produce, nobody, nobody buys it, okay? So they're gonna be selling a bit more because that quantity demand is gonna increase, but they're still gonna end up having a bunch of surplus or the market's gonna have a bunch of surplus at the sale price because it's still not low enough. So there's still a surplus. 
this would be you know surplus one, this is surplus two or something. So they keep lowering the price until they reach this equilibrium quantity, right? Now, what are some of the reasons that they would lower the price? Why wouldn't they just wait until the price, until, um, why wouldn't they just wait until somebody bought it or until, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Well, so that could be a reason why they're pricing it so high. Absolutely. But what, like, let's say, remember, we're trying to think on the margin. Right, so we're that's in that's a sunk cost. We can't we can't change production anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You still have to pay their workers. They got to pay their workers. They only have so much kind of like savings or cash on hand to burn. Right. You know they would call it uh, powder or whatever. To, or uh, yeah. powder in the keg or something like that. Right. How, how much just like cash you have to burn until you run out of money. Um, so, but so there's a time element, right? And so part of it is you can't just pause everything and like furlough workers and expect them to come back and be as efficient or whatever, right? You kind of tell them like, go home, we can't pay you and come back and you'll have a job or something. Um, and then also, you know, what, think about, you know, DVD players, right? Like who wants a DVD player? Like if you're gonna buy something, it's gonna be like a Blu-ray player or a 4K player or something, you know what I mean? And so, you know, technology and a lot of these, these things uh, get outdated really fast, right? And so you can't just leave something in a warehouse and hope that it's gonna sell in the future because it may very well be completely useless, you know? I think about, I, you guys probably don't, know, don't even know what an iPod is, but it used to be like essentially an iPhone that didn't have any phone features, right? It was just an MP3 player, you know, nobody has this anymore at all. Um, if, you, if you like kind of stored a bunch of iPods, you, they would be useless, you know, they're, they're, they're as good as, uh, paperweights these days, right? Um, and so you don't want to, you know, just kind of wait on things because you might never be able to sell them. And then also you don't want to wait on things because it costs money to store things, right? Like physical storage of things costs money. So there's a few different reasons, right? I mean, it, it makes sense when it's durable good because, you know, the, the, it's going to rot, <laughs> right? You know, so we need to sell it soon. So we're going to drop the price on it because otherwise, you know, some money is better than none. All right, um, so that's the reason why if we have excess uh, supply, right? What if we had, uh, you know, an excess demand situation, right? So let's, let's think about what if the price was set too low for some particular reason, right? I had the price down here, then I would end up having only a little bit supplied. And because the price is so low, a whole bunch of people are going to want whatever that good is. So a low price is going to result in the opposite of a surplus, which is a shortage. So we see this kind of all the time with, you know, iPhones, the latest iPhone and stuff like that, right? Um, now part of that is because they kind of, you know, the shortages, we've learned that essentially like you can get a bunch of free press by having shortages or kind of artificially creating shortages, right? So, you know, when people are like lining up overnight to, you know, get something from the store, right? Then the news covers it or something, right? And then that's essentially a commercial for that product, right? And, um, and so these shortages are, are kind of a strategic or marketing tactic in a way, right? Uh, but also like some places like, you know, I mean, Apple uh, and Xbox, I mean, you guys know that like your Xboxes and PS4s, like the, the cost of the firmware and everything in them is way more than the price of it. Like they sell those at a loss and then they make the money back up on the game on the games so same thing with an the iphone they make the money on you know the icloud and you know all the other different kind of like monthly or yearly services that they get you right 
So um, yeah, it's actually really funny. At one point, the US military, like DARPA, the, Dep the Department for Advanced Research, or whatever, right? They had a, it was like 70 Xboxes linked together in like a series because they were making an AI like supercomputer and that was the cheapest way. They were just running all of these Xboxes like in parallel with each other because, you know, because essentially like Xbox eats money every time it produces and sells one of those consoles, right? Um, so that's also part of the reason why, you know, like when a new system comes out, like the Switch, there were shortages and things like that, right? Uh, you know, but again, that's like kind of, you know, they're, they're trying to, to generate that for the extra uh, marketing and the extra, extra sales, right? So if, uh, if we were to have this kind of situation, right, then essentially each supplier has an incentive to, to push the price up, right? So they would be pushing the price up. It's a similar story, right? Until this shortage goes away and they find an equilibrium price, P star, where everything that is supplied is demanded. And that's our golden equilibrium situation. So this is a lot of economics is just this, this model, complications of this model. So it's really important that we, that we kind of get a solid foundation of what's going on here right now. So there's a couple of examples of things, you know, but I'm going to kind of skip them. Let's just go and talk about our shifts. What are the actual things? So now that we know that there are supply and demand and, you know, there's equilibrium. If the price is too low, there's going to be a shortage. If the price is too high, there's going to be a surplus, right? Now that we know that this is going on, I hate to tell you, but these supply and demand curves, they kind of do a little bit of jumping around depending on various factors, All right? So let's figure out what those factors are. So the causes, causes of a shift in demand, So the first one that kind of makes sense, right, is income. And so, you know, if it's a, and I talked to you guys a little bit about this, right, that there's two different kinds of goods, right? We've got normal goods, which are just that, they're normal, as your income increases, your demand, increases, but then we also have inferior goods. Which is just the opposite, right? As the income increases, the demand decreases. So, you know, again, we can think about ramen noodles, bus rides, a generic brand, anything. Except for medicines. There's just no reason to not, not get generic medicines. But like peanut butter and bread and stuff, like there's no. There's no. <laughs> um, all right, so what about, uh, you know, preferences, right? We talked about how Yes, consumers have sovereignty, they vote with their dollar, right? But also uh, the, the preferences are endogenous, right? They're kind of they're part and parcel to the system. That's why marketing and advertising is a multi, because it's like multi-million dollar, you know, enterprise a year, right? And so preferences, and so we can think about, you know, dinosaur toys, dinosaur, after, the Jurassic Park movies. Jurassic, I cannot spell. Jurassic Park. 
or other, just anything, right? You know, any kind of, of baby shark, right? You know, like who the hell was buying baby shark stuff before that YouTube video? Most of you don't know that unless you have younger siblings. Uh, so yeah, so preferences um, are going to really influence the, the demand. So it's going to shift the demand. So get, what am I talking about when I'm talking about shift in demand, first of all? Back it up, Chris. What are you talking about when you talk about shift in demand? Well, I'm talking about the demand curve is going over one side or the other. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a shift. So we know we know about changes along the demand curve, right? A change along the demand curve is just this situation, right? Where we had the first price, we went down, we had a sale, and we ended up increasing the amount of stuff. So preferences are something that causes an increase in demand usually. The number of buyers, right, all of a sudden. So the best way to think about this is, you know, all of a sudden you, sorry, all of a sudden you might, you know, get, uh, you know, your product into Walmart or something like that. Or, you know, so like um, if you go from state to international distribution, right? That's like a huge thing. So, you know, you know, get your toy in Walmart. So the number of buyers in your market, so that might be that, you know, the number of people in the United States, like the actual population increases, but it's normally like your market increases, right? You know, you normally were only able to kind of, you know, hit toy stores in, you know, Nebraska or whatever, and then you were able to crack the Walmart cookie, and now you're in Walmarts all over, uh, you know, the country and, and elsewhere. Uh, do, do, do. I'm gonna save these other two for a second. So the last one, and this is actually, so again, you know, we've, we've got a cool opportunity here living in this uh, situation. Expectations about the future. This is why, you know, all the hand sanitizer and everything, you know, went away and like why the masks and stuff were like so expensive at first, right? Like people were freaking out and just like panic buying, you know? And so if people think that, that the price is gonna go up or the, there'll be a scarcity, right? There might be shortages. Uh, they're gonna buy more now. That's why, you know, throughout this whole thing, Walmart and all the other grocery stores and stuff, you know, they did well, they were like hiring the whole time. So now we've got our two kind of tricky shifters. I don't want to talk about, I don't want to put a cap on this. I can find it. So the two tricky ones that we have are, we've got this notion of a complementary good. So the price of a complementary good. What do I mean by complementary? And this is complementary with an E, not complementary, which is like a compliment, like you're so pretty today, right? This is different. This means like, you, like this goes with this, right? So the price of complementary goods so, you know, e.g., you know, uh, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, hot dogs and hot dog rolls. Shrimp and cocktail sauce. I dare you to find something else you can dip in cocktail sauce that tastes good. It, it doesn't exist. It's only shrimp. The only thing. So what happens if the price of one of these things goes up, right? Well, you're going to demand less of the other thing, right? If all of a sudden hot dogs are really expensive, even though you may really love to grill hot dog buns on, you know what I mean, or something like that, right? And you like the way that they taste or whatever, you know, you're just going to be like, mm, I'm just going to get burgers instead, right? So we have a lot of other goods that we can switch to 
right? And so that's part of the reason why when a complementary good goes up, we demand less of whatever that other good is. They're kind of tied to each other. And then that brings me to our last shifter in demand, which is the price of a substitute good. All right, so hot dogs versus hamburgers. Uh, you know, orange juice versus apple juice or something. You know, at a certain point, you're just going to switch to the other product. And the demand is going to shift inwards as a result. The important thing to remember, right? The price of the actual thing itself that we're like analyzing never causes a shift in demand. So let's write that down because we're gonna want, we're gonna want to do that so much. It's just our tendency as new students in economics, right? So price changes of the good or market, right? That we're talking about um, that is, is, you know, essentially of the graph. Never, ever uh, causes a shift in demand. Right? A price change will cause an increase in the quantity demanded. It'll cause an increase in the quantity demanded like this, right? So yeah, the quantity demanded will increase when you have a price change from P0 to P1, but it doesn't cause a shift in demand. We're gonna wanna do it. It's just the way that our mind works, right? We're just like, well, it's, it's cheaper now, so the demand's gonna shift out. No, never, never happens. It's cheaper now, so there's more demanded. Yeah, totally. Because there's a movement along the demand curve. Never ever causes a, a shift in the demand, right? We know that price causes just cause movements along demand. All right, so let's go ahead and do a little kind of quiz on your own. So go ahead and I'll give you guys a couple minutes to tell me what is going to happen to the, the sale of tennis balls. So if this is tennis balls, what is gonna happen? So, and we start out, we've got this kind of demand, we've got this kind of supply situation, right? You know, we just like generically label it. Uh, this is gonna be my P star, right? LMNOP, QRS, right? And this is gonna be my Q star. Awesome, so what's gonna happen to the, the the market for tennis balls and specifically demand. I'll tell you that's going to be the, the demand, right? So the question is going to be what happens to the demand? When the price of rental courts increases. And you know, we can also think about the availability of rental courts decreases, right? That's probably what's happening. A lot of country clubs and crap have been closed down. And so maybe, you know, probably the only courts open in a lot of places are the public courts. And so what's going to happen to the demand when the price of the tennis courts increases or the availability of the tennis courts increases? Go ahead and try it on your own.
Was your answer that the demand would shift outwards? Because that is not the actual answer, right? If the rental price of courts, the availability of courts increased, then fewer people are going to be using tennis balls. So since these things are complements, and rental courts are complements, a price increase in one will cause a, and so I'm gonna use specific language here because especially with supply, it gets confusing if we don't. So I know it sounds weird at first, but just go with me a leftward shift in the demand. The resulting equilibrium price and quantity, we would say P star star, Q star star, and so if we were kind of writing this answer out, right, we would say the resulting equilibrium price and quantity are lower. Any questions on that? Oh, and then we'd also probably say like D, we could say D2, right? We could label this D1 and D2, or we could do D, I like zero, starting at zero. D0 and D1. Because zero kind of like lets me know, like you understand that like this is where this problem starts, right? Because again, what's economics? It's a, it's a marginal analysis, right? It's, it's we're looking at things uh, based on the margin, right? So we're, we're, we're there's a situation going on, right, that time zero, and then we're trying to make a decision or we're trying to make a prediction about what happens uh, as a result of the movement of something, everything else equal, right? That Latin term, ceteris paribus, we're gonna freeze everything else in the universe and assume that it's equal. Any questions on demand shifters? All right, cool. So your, your Friday reflection will be like either a demand or a supply shift. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about shift and supply and maybe we can get out of here a few minutes early. All right, so. Causes of shifts in supply. So the biggest one, the one that makes the most sense, right, uh, is essentially the factors of production, right? So a change in the price or availability of an input. And so you'll see this oftentimes uh, talked about as, uh, you know, the factors of production, right, FOP. So you got to be careful here because some things, and I've kind of alluded to this a bit, right, but some things you wouldn't think are impacted by the price of oil. But essentially what we've learned, what we've seen historically, like there was a time when, when I mean, there's, there's been a few times now where we've had oil shocks and the price of oil has spiked. And essentially, uh, you know, everything gets more expensive, right? Because just oil is tied into packaging, it's tied into transportation, it's tied into a lot of different things, right? So it's not just the cost of labor, it's not just the cost of whatever the, the you know, the, the wood is for making the birdhouses, right? It's also the cost of the pe plastic packaging, you know, the cost of the filler for the, for the boxes and then the cost to ship it, um, you know, between places while it's getting made and then also to that final store, or final consumer, if it's Amazon or something, right? Um, so, you know, just some examples of this, right, you know, it would be, you know, if, we, if we're building a house, right, it's just going to be like construction wages 
and then the cost of materials. You know, for a skateboard, right, it would be the fiberglass. So this one, you know, makes the most kind of sense, right? The second one also, you know, makes a lot of sense given that, you know, we're all very familiar with technology, right? So if there's technological improvement, right? So changes in technology. Also known as, you know, technological improvement. then as a result, uh, you know, there, there's going to be outward shifts in supply. So, you know, if there's technological improvement, then that means that, and so we'll, let's talk about a shift in supply real quick. Then that means that at any given price, the way I like to think about supply, is at any given price, if there's some technological improvement that makes it cheaper for me to make it, whatever it is, right? Books, uh, you know, bird houses, you know, cars, whatever the computers, right? Then at that given price that I'm gonna expect from the market, am I gonna be making less, the same, or more of that particular good? I'm gonna be making more, right? So I always kind of ask myself that when I'm, when I'm doing these supply chain, these supply changes as a, you know, gut check to tell myself that, okay, well, if I'm a producer and I'm at this P zero and technology improves, well, then I'm going to be making more, not less as a result. For the most part, we, we almost always see rightward progress here, right? You know, we haven't really had a, a, a modern dark ages or anything like that, right? Where like techniques have been lost or something, you know? For the most part, it's always uh, shifting to the right, to the right every year. Uh, do, do, do. We've got, uh, you know, weather, right? So a lot of the major, you know, investment funds and things like that, um, you know, they got very successful, very, very profitable, made a lot of money and still do by looking at weather patterns, right? So not just, you know, for agricultural commodities, but also, you know, outdoor entertainment. So weather's gonna be a significant factor in supply. If there's a drought, supply shrinks up, right? Pretty, pretty simple. I think we don't need to explain that too much here. The number of sellers, the number of sellers, right? If all of a sudden, uh, you know, because of the trade deals or whatever, you know, if all of a sudden, there was all this really cheap quality beef flooding the US market, right? Um, that would end up dropping the price, right? And so the number of sellers in the market would shift this supply out. And so for any given demand curve, let's just go ahead and put a demand curve in here real quick. For any given demand curve, we would go from this price, this original price, our new equilibrium price would be way less. Right, so if our sellers increase, then we're gonna have a price drop because essentially there's, uh, there's just more people in the market willing to provide the goods at any given price. And then the last one, probably the most difficult one for any of us to kind of wrap our heads around right, because it's both in demand and in supply, it's the expectation of future price changes. And so 
remember with demand, if they expected that the price would be more in the future, they would have a shift outwards in demand. Well, with supply, if you expect the price to be more in the future, what are you going to do? You're going to hold your hold you hold all your cards close, right? So the supply is going to kind of shrink up as a result. So, you know, let's say just for the sake of argument, um, you know, Biden gets elected or something, right? Well, remember, I don't think you guys probably don't know, but when Obama got elected, sales of guns and bullets and stuff went through the roof, right? And so essentially everybody expected that there would be all this regulation and, you know, he's coming for your guns and you're not going to be able to get them and stuff like that, right? And so the demand for that increased significantly. Um, and then the supply of it, uh, there actually wasn't really any shift in supply. There was just movement along the supply curve. Right, so let's go ahead and real quick just model that. So if there was some sort of, you know, liberal scare, price, quantity, demand, supply, right? Then essentially, even though nothing else has changed, the demand would shift outwards for guns and bullets and things like that, right? And we would see the price go up a little bit and we would see the quantity demanded increase. We did see some of this during the beginning of the pandemic, right? Everybody went out and panic bought more guns and ammunition, slept next to shotguns. Good times. Now, what if uh, simultaneous to this, uh, what if there actually was, were some regulations that made it harder, or let's just say the government taxed. There's this old, uh, I think it's Chris Rock joke about, you know, I don't know why they make bullets so cheap. If they made bullets really expensive and people would think twice about shooting somebody else with them, you know what I mean? Like, and so what if the government taxed bullets to try to make them, you know, a thousand dollars a piece or something like that, right? Well, that would be a leftward shift in the supply curve. And so yes, we can have the supply and the demand shifting at the same time. So it'd be D0, S0, D1, and then I'd probably call this, like you could call it S1 or S2. It just depends. S1 would probably tell me they're happening at the same time. S2 would probably tell me that, you know, the demand shifting first. And so we end up going up to this equilibrium price in quantity and then you know the, the person gets elected and actually takes you know and then they make it more expensive right and so then the supply does go ahead and actually shrinks because of increased taxes increased government regulation right and so as a result what do i need to do i need to extend this demand curve so that i can look at where the new equilibrium is between the supply and the demand curve, right? My Q2. And I drew this exactly how I wanted to draw this, right? Because what is the change in the quantity in this situation, right? Remember that triangle just means change, right? So when I'm asking what's the change in the quantity of this situation, the answer is we don't know. We know that price increased twice, Right, one's from the demand increase because you know everybody just had this perception that you know that it was going to be more expensive in the future, right? And then the price increased again because of this the, the shortage in supply, not really shortage, sorry, the, the leftward shift, right? Again, we want to use that kind of language because otherwise it gets really confusing. Leftward shift in supply, but we have no idea what happens to the equilibrium quantity. Okay, so at any given time, right, when there's two shifts. So we'll leave off with this. And then again, that Friday reflection essay is just gonna be a, do a graph like this and send it to me. Just take a picture of your cell phone, just send it to me as a whatever image file, okay? So at the end of the day, the key lesson I want you guys to remember is when both curves shift, either, price 
or the quantity will be like ambiguous or undetermined. You'll only be able to kind of predict half of the story. All right, and this is really, you know, this is nice because it also tells us and shows us, you know, the inherent difficulty in economics, right? As soon as we start to complicate things, even just a little bit, by adding another shift, all of a sudden we lose a bit of information, right? Before we were able to tell you what happened to both price and quantity, now we can only tell you what happens with one. All right, awesome, have a safe weekend. Email me with any uh, issues, problems you have, questions. Uh, I'm gonna put these up on YouTube and send an announcement out. Uh, it's just taking a while to process and upload.